friends, and welcome to another tutorial in the Fantasy Armor series. This time, I'll be demonstrating how to make an articulating leather breastplate and backplate, also known as a cuirass. My typical medium of choice is leather, so that is what I'll be demonstrating here. But you may adapt this to other mediums if you prefer. This tutorial is meant to be beginner friendly with some of the leather working techniques being simplified. It will also build upon some of the previous tutorials which all demonstrate slightly different techniques that you can use on this and future builds. There's much more to come so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future tutorials and project builds. Before we begin, let me thank Tandy Leather for sponsoring this video. Tandy is an excellent resource for anyone working with leather, even more so for getting started as they are always knowledgeable and helpful. Recently, they replaced their pricing system with what they are calling Everyday Honest Prices. This eliminates the old complicated membership tiers and resets prices on everything. Their 100 year anniversary is just around the corner, so go visit a store near you, or click the affiliate link below to shop online. As always, the first thing is to print and cut out the patterns. One shortcut I can give you if your patterns print with margins is to trim the areas where the lines will connect so that it is easier to piece the pages together accurately. I also like to tack the pages together with small bits of tape first in case I need to adjust the alignment before taping all the seams. See the included document for additional tips and sizing options. The default size should fit around a 40 inch chest with a decent margin either way depending on how you set your buckles. I generally suggest making a mock-up of the patterns before committing to more expensive materials. You don't want to commit to materials until you're confident the fit is good. You can always trace the printouts onto a poster board like this. It's very quick to do and can be held together with brass plated fasteners. Once your mock-up is finished, you'll be able to confirm the fit more accurately. Also note that the pattern sides can easily be added to or trimmed as needed. And of course, you can scale the whole pattern set up or down according to your needs. When you have your patterns ready, you will trace them onto the leather. I'm using a superior oak side of leather around 9 ounce from Tandy. Leather can often come with natural defects and brands that you'll normally want to work around. So you may want to scrutinize the hide first and mark any blemishes you find to avoid. This pattern requires you to mirror all of the components symmetrically. And for this project, it took approximately three-fifths of the side. You can use lighter or heavier weight on your projects according to your preferences and needs. A fine point marker is ideal for this, and have something solid and pointy on hand to stab in the reference marks for the holes that you'll need to punch out later. Before I cut out the parts, I will usually use a utility knife to separate the leather into more manageable pieces. From there, I'll be using my craft tool shears to finish cutting the pieces. If you don't have shears, a utility knife also works quite well as demonstrated in previous tutorials. Since this is a bigger project with many large pieces that will need to be tooled, I'll be pre-soaking the leather at this point so that the core will be adequately saturated when I begin working each piece. I'm submerging the leather into warm water and feeding it through so that there is about 3 seconds of contact with the water. I'll be slightly pre-soaking the leather at this point so that the core will be adequately saturated when beginning work with each piece. Quick bonus tip, if you are trying to use shears but finding it difficult, you can do this stage first to make it much easier when cutting. Next you can use a stylus or a ballpoint pen to transfer the design features. If you soak to the leather as described previously, you won't need to dampen the leather further at this point. Just make sure the surface is now dry enough to avoid soaking through the paper pattern. As with the previous tutorials, I will transfer the barbed design elements and avoid transferring the longer spans of border. That process is better done with an adjustable compass to ensure a consistent line. For the outermost border, I'm using a small edge stitch groover, which will cut away a strand from the surface of the leather and leave behind a nice groove, which for our purposes is cosmetic. All it takes is adjusting the blade and applying an even pressure as you drag it along the edge. As with many processes, this step is optional and up to your preferences. Mm -hmm. 
to commit the design lines to the leather, I will carve them with my swivel knife. As always, start with a sharp blade and strop a few times so that your blade glides smoothly. The lines you would be carving here are broad and sweeping, so it's a good basic practice to build your muscle memory as we build towards more advanced techniques in the future. When you carve with a swivel knife, you're making a permanent cut, but you'll usually only go about halfway through, which will not impair the stronger connective fibers of the leather. With the piece still damp, I'll be using a number one craft tool beveler to trim the edges from the tops and bottoms of all the pieces. This gives the leather edges a smoother and rounder profile. One extra edge treatment I like to do at this stage is burnishing. I'll dampen the edges a bit with a sponge and water, then I'll take my slicking tool, which has a rounded groove, and use friction to compress and burnish the edge fibers of the leather. This results in a smoother appearance that is more comfortable to the touch. Next, I'll be using a rotary hand punch to make the holes for the piece. There are only a few holes in this design that the hand punch can't reach. The rest can be done with a typical hole punch. Now as for the tooling for this piece, I decided to go with smooth beveling stamps all around the borders and design lines. It gives it a slight pillow embossed look. It's a subtle effect, you could go for a much more attention grabbing effect for the same effort, but it's enough to make the piece stand out as a whole. Again, it comes down to your own preference as to what, if any, tooling effects you want to do. And just to add a little extra decoration, I picked out another tool to decorate the horizontal banding on the lower plates. Border tooling is a simple way to add a little extra visual appeal and value to your piece. I would encourage you to experiment with stamps to come up with interesting effects for your piece. As for the tooling about how the distressed effect is achieved, I'm going to split that technique off into its own video which will come soon after this one. So if that's of interest to you, make sure you're subbed and signed up for notifications so you don't miss it. For the coloring of this piece, I know we've already done red and black, but you know what? I like it. For the red and the black, I'm using Phoebing's Pro Oil dye. I'll start with black using a piece of sponge and a brush so that I can better control how it is applied along the lines. Then I'll go over the central area with the red. Next I'll buff some of the excess pigment with a paper towel. I'm actually going for a distressed look, so if some of the black blends a little into the red, it works in my favor here, but for a cleaner look, buff the color separately with separate towels. 
I'll repeat this process for the remaining pieces. The back pieces I decided to go with all black. For the finish, I'll be using Satin Sheen, which is an acrylic product. It has less glossy finish compared to Super Sheen, which will fit this look better. I apply a generous coat with a sponge on both sides. I want the product to absorb into the leather to help it firm up and also to prevent dye from bleeding. The assembly of this project should be fairly straightforward, but before the rivets go in, I would suggest you shape the pieces a little bit. Ideally, do this while the pieces are still damp from the sheen process. You can also do this before applying the dye if you prefer, as the leather is easier to work with at this stage. However, you only need a subtle shape to get a good look on this piece, so it's fine to do it at this stage as well. If you choose not to do any forming, it might be a little tougher to get the rivets to line up, and it might look a little lumpy. All of the top pieces of the breastplate should have a slight dish at it. For the back plate, I'm focusing more around the shoulders. And for the front, I'm wanting more of a smooth dome across the whole front. I don't expect everyone to have a dedicated forming tool like this, but you can get creative. For example, you can use something like a softball or a bowling ball, or find something cheap online like an acrylic hemisphere. And for the bottom back pieces, you can add a bend that's in a valley shape to accentuate the spine. Don't go too extreme with the shape either. You can always tweak the shape more once you finish the assembly. Because this is a shaped piece, to set the rivets you'll either have to turn the piece over and set it flat, or if you want to use a rivet setter for a more domed rivet appearance, you'll have to elevate your surface with something like this mini anvil or some other striking face. You can either start from the middle and work your way out, or from the outside and work your way to the center. Keep in mind there are many factors that can make a rivet hole misalign. For example, your tooling might have stretched the leather, or if you formed the leather too much in the shaping stage, or if you weren't precise enough with your tracing and hole punching. So you might have to wrestle the leather a little bit to coax it into position, or even migrate the leather hole position slightly, preferably on the underside layer to maintain the visible layer symmetry.
To connect all of the components, we will be using a retaining strap. This is a simple but highly underutilized technique which makes the difference between a usable breastplate and a sad tube of leather. It allows the plates to compress and twist easily with movement. You should use a thin and supple piece of leather, but something that doesn't have a lot of give or stretch, so most chrome tan leathers are out. You don't want it stretching out too much over time. In this example, I'm using some pre-dyed leather that is around a medium firmness and weight. Once I finish making the front and back straps, I'll start to connect all the components with the rivets. It will be easiest to start with the bottom plates. Oh, and always double check your order of components before committing the rivets. It's pretty easy to mix up the pieces. Now I'll just work my way up, connecting the plates in order. Finally, we come to the buckle placement. Buckles are covered completely in our recent tutorial with accompanying guide and pattern pack, so please reference those resources for making the buckles for this project. I suggest making your buckles from 3 quarter inch to 1 inch in width, and the length will be up to you. Keep in mind that where you place your buckles will determine how it fits, and you can decide if you want to wear the armor loose or snug, and plan ahead for wearing additional items like an arming gambeson. I personally don't suggest wearing a breastplate super tight. I think slightly snug is a good goal so the plates can still flex and compress with movement easily. So where do we attach the buckles? If you have a form that is approximately your size, that is probably the easiest way. You can mark the holes as demonstrated here. If you don't have that, the next best thing is to have a friend help hold the pieces up and get your reference marks from there. If you start with the top and add the buckles to connect the front and the back, you'll have an easier time matching up the sides from there. Just make sure they are even when you mark one side, then you can simply transfer those marks to the other side with the aid of a paper pattern. As for the hardware, I was torn between these more decorative Al Stolman buckles and the darker antique buckles. Since I decided on the distressed look, I went with the darker buckles. The rivets being used here are the medium and long double cap rivets. One additional tip I should mention is if you make the shoulder pauldrons from the previous tutorial, you can add a strap or two at the top of the breastplate and suspend it from there instead of using the big chest strap. This will improve mobility quite a bit. One of the goals I have for these videos is to keep improving the production value, which I'm able to do with your support. So I really appreciate those of you who do buy these patterns, as well as our Patreon supporters. And if you would like to see some behind the scenes, early access, work in progress content, and access to the latest patterns, I hope you'll consider checking it out at patreon.com slash princearmory. And if you want to pick up this pattern, head on over to academy at princearmory.com. And again, thanks to Tandy Leather for supporting this video. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks again for watching. I hope to see you next time.